uh, farmer that we're working with uh, because it, it takes a lot of effort to run these field experiments and a, a lot of uh, collaboration to make sure it's done well. Uh, I'm just gonna gloss over our methods here. We basically apply these materials in the easiest way possible. Put them on the soil surface previous to, prior to planting, incorporated uh, when you were uh, incorporating seed and fertilizer. Uh, this first year, we were experimenting on a, on a winter triticale crop. Uh, in the future, that's gonna be summer sunflowers next year, followed by a, a winter grass hay. Uh, we had uh, randomized complete block designs. We have replications in the field, five different treatments, including an unfertilizer, unfertilized control. And on the bottom, on top of all our organic soil amendments, we went in there by hand and applied different rates of inorganic and fertilizer. So we had to take that extra step to be able to understand if we're gonna reduce our inorganic end rates and apply the organic materials and still have the same yield, is that possible? Uh, the first step, I'm gonna just touch on this briefly uh, before I hand it to, over to Valentina. Um, measuring greenhouse gas emissions takes a ton of work and it's a very labor intensive process uh, because soil microbes are always active and you have to go out there and try and cap the soil and sample over time to understand what that flux rate is. We were looking at three different gases, nitrous oxide, the one I already mentioned, methane and CO2. Um, we were collecting these over a 30 minute period, kind of every couple of weeks during the growing season and analyzing them on a GC in the lab. This is our data, top is methane, middle is CO2, bottom is nitrous oxide. Uh, Overall, we saw low fluxes of all three gases, which was not surprising. Last winter was cold and wet. Microbes uh, need temperature. And we did see evidence specifically in our nitrous oxide of a higher peak occurring kind of in May near the end of the season when soil started to warm up and uh, that microbial activity was really apparent. Uh, similarly, we did see some higher CO2 fluxes earlier than that in the spring but not a lot higher for our organic amendments, actually. So that was one uh, somewhat surprising result. These data are preliminary. Those are the daily fluxes. You can translate this into kind of a seasonal mass loss. Uh, I'm gonna skip over that one in the interest of time. We didn't see a lot of large differences among our treatments, which is a positive, right? So overall, the goal is, can we increase soil carbon without increasing these daily fluxes of soil greenhouse gases? So on the whole, we have a, a, a net reduction in uh, uh, greenhouse gas emissions. After three years, we're gonna go back to these same plots where we've been applying these materials and seeing what is the gain in soil carbon. That really is the net difference, which accounts for a lot of factors, our plant respiration during the season, our root growth, microbial decomposition in the soil. Ultimately, we wanna end up and see are our carbon concentrations uh, higher, but we have that uh, to be determined later. Okay, I'm gonna hand it over to Valentina here. Okay, as Cameron said, one of our objectives um, was if we were able to reduce the inorganic nitrogen inputs to the system. So our main question was, can we reduce the need for external nitrogen inputs by applying organic nitrogen sources? and if we were also able to monitor our, the crop status to detect nitrogen stress. So uh, the main problem or the main thing that we have to think about when we apply organic amendments is if we're able to quantify the timing and the quantity that, of plant available nitrogen that's gonna be, gonna be coming from these organic sources. So we were using remote sensing tools uh, to see if we were able to monitor the crop nitrogen status. So our three main objectives were to assess the changes in relative crop nitrogen status during the growing season, using remote sensing technologies, to also evaluate the impact of organic amendments on crop productivity and nitrogen fertilizer requirements. And we did this harvesting on two different um, times, soft dough, which is a forage harvest, and then we collected grain yield at physiological maturity. And then at the end of the season, we also wanted to evaluate the nitrogen recovery efficiency from these sources using two different methods. One only accounting for the inorganic nitrogen fertilizer that we were applying, which was urea. And another method that we were using was the total system nitrogen inputs, 
that was accounting for the organic and the inorganic nitrogen sources. So as I said, we use remote sensing technologies. First of all, we used a proximal sensor as a ground to get ground truth data. Then we correlated that with the images that we were getting from the drone, getting a very high correlation. As I said, we harvested at two different stages, at soft dough and at physiological maturity. And from early in the season, we saw a very good correlation between the NDRE values, that's the vegetation index that we were using, and the yields that we got at the end of the season. And also to assess nitrogen recovery efficiency, we had to send out our samples out to get nitrogen concentration. So what we can see here is for our first, first objective to assess changes in relative crop nitrogen status during our growing season. So to do this, we calculate a sufficiency index, which is the sufficiency index is calculated with the NDRE value for each pot divided the maximum NDRE for that date. And what I'm showing here is only what was happening on one day. So what we can see here is that the digestive liquid at the first three rates is yielding higher than the control on those three rates. And this is gonna see, you're gonna see something very similar uh, that's gonna be happening in our grain yields at the end of the season. So to evaluate the impact of organic amendments on crop productivity, we, as I said, we harvested at two different times. What we're seeing here is our biomass yield at soft dough. So we were harvesting the whole plant while, while it still was green. And we saw a source effect. Here, what we can see is that the AD liquid, the digested liquid is yielding higher than the control. And since we had a split plot design, we also wanted to see what was happening with the different yields. And what we can see here is also that there is a rate effect within each source. The AD liquid seems to plateau experiencing like a quadratic curve, while the other sources still increase um, as we increase nitrogen rates. Something similar was happening when we harvested for grain yield, but in this case, the source effect that we're seeing is because the digestates are performing higher than the hydrolysate, but we didn't see any difference with the control. And we also saw a very similar effect within each, uh, between rates within each source. So as I said, to conclude, we also wanted to calculate the nitrogen recovery efficiency, and we did this uh, using two different methods. The one that you can see on top is the nitrogen recovery efficiency from the urea, and for this, we used the zero urea plot in each treatment as the control, divided the amount of, nit of inorganic nitrogen that we were applying. And our second method, we we're accounting for the total nitrogen that we were putting into each plot. So we were using as a, as a control, the, the true control for the whole experiment, which was the zero urea from the control plot. This didn't receive any nitrogen, any inorganic or organic nitrogen. So we divided that by a total nitrogen that the system um, received. So when we go to see the results of the first method, what we can see is that the digestate solids which are a very high carbon source, are experiencing very low nitrogen recovery efficiencies when we apply low amounts of nitrogen. But we'll, when we apply enough nitrogen to feed the microorganisms and to feed the plants, we don't see any differences at all between the different sources. And in contrast, what we can see when we account for the total nitrogen inputs of the system, we now um, we're not able to see that low efficiency that the digested solids were seeing in this graph. Now, all the alternative sources experience a very similar nitrogen, re nitrogen recovery efficiency when we apply low urea rates, and then we don't see any differences when we apply um, 120 units of nitrogen. So to conclude, Based on what Cameron showed, um, preliminary data shows uh, the potential of field greenhouse gas emission reduction from some of these sources. Remote sensing can also be a very interesting tool to assess um, crop nitrogen status when we're using these sources that are difficult to predict their plant available nitrogen. Um, AD liquid, the digested liquid, um, yielded significantly more biomass than the control when we were harvesting at this first growth stage soft dough. 
And then a very important aspect, if we're going to be using these sources um, in agricultural fields, is we have to still provide enough inorganic nitrogen so we don't see any differences in the nitrogen recovery efficiency. All right, last few slides here. Um, so again, this is just year one of three. Uh, so kind of our preliminary results. Uh, the big question is over the three years, do soil greenhouse gas emissions stay low enough and can we increase soil carbon uh, with our application rates? Uh, and then something else that we're just starting is kind of an economic analysis. I'll describe that in, in a moment because I think that's in an opportunity to engage with this community and understand the, the limitations there and kind of feed in all of these aspects into a broader life cycle analysis. Um, you know, trying to understand the situation in California and look to the future, uh, I think it's um, positive and uh, uh, inspiring to look at countries elsewhere who have already adopted these practices and developed the regulatory protocols and the market system and, and it's all functioning, okay? We are not there yet. I think we're still understanding what's the what's the potential and what are the barriers. Um, and I think there's a lot of opportunities for kind of these low cost processing technologies, storage, transportation, uh, et cetera. Uh, these are just a couple of examples uh, from the UK where there's a, a lot of dairy di uh, digesters, uh, not just related to, to dairies actually. And a lot of that digesting is going back to agricultural fields. You can't see it so well here on, on the screen, uh, but this is a, a commercial application of, of something very similar to what we're doing in, in our project. Uh, in our economic analysis, uh, we're going to be reaching out to folks to understand what are the, you know, the current um, costs that facilities face uh, when dealing with this as kind of as a waste product, these digestates, and where is it going, and how much does the, the trucking and shipping cost. Uh, on the other end, farmers are paying a lot for fertilizer. So we're trying to connect those two worlds. And uh, there are big differences. I want everybody to know there's big differences in organic and inorganic fertilizer sources and the reliability and predictability of their release. Uh, but still, if there's an opportunity for merging these, these uh, two uh, sectors, I, I think that's promising. The, our emails are here, uh, and we'd be happy to, to start these discussions and learn a lot as we conduct this economic analysis and, and look towards the feasibility. That's it from us. Thanks for your time today. All right, with that, I'll invite all of the panels back up. Mark, if you want to come back up for questions. Um, if you have a question, please come up to the podium and you can turn on the microphone. Just press the little button, it should be green. And each of you can activate your mics. All right. Well, I've uh, questions for everyone, but I'm not going to. Hopefully, we can talk after uh, during the break. But uh, since Dr. Zhang, uh, thank you very much. And uh, I was just wondering have you looked into degradation of uh, polylactic acid uh, plastics in your system? Yeah, that was a, a good question. Um, not the, at the read. And uh, I have done a uh, lab testing of uh, uh, nine different types of uh, bioplastics or, well, pl bi biodegradable plastic uh, as well as uh, some um, you know, cellulose based uh, products. And uh, uh, so certainly when you look at the, all these plastics uh, <laughs> um, that come in with the feedstock, with the food waste, and uh, yes, the biodegradability it's a plastic cream uh, problems for digesters and especially for the uh, digestate use. And a uh, great question. To answer your question, not that the read, and uh, but the, in the lab we have done. Now, so um, I have project uh, uh, and uh, producing biodegradable plastics, uh, not a PLA, but the uh, PHA and uh, uh, using the food waste. Uh, yeah, especially like a uh, organic acid. So the, the, the reason I asked about PLA in particular is, that, you know, the, uh, I come from Sonoma State where they were just using it uh, for all their food wear and it's pretty much just going, it's com confusing the recycling and the composting. So everyone here is familiar with that problem. But um, 
your system, if you're going to build something for breaking that down, is like it would be like the perfect design because you're operating near the glass transition temperature. You can uh, the enzymes can get at the material and break it down. I'm you know, I'm basing this on research of others, but uh, it should break down to lactic acid in your hydro, your hydrolytic tank and then uh, be a good substrate for the digestion tank. So um, if you need any, I got plenty. Of probably like it asked for doing research on. It's already been ground down. Well, thank you. Thank you. I wanted to follow up with you. And definitely, especially uh, our digesters are thermophilic and that temperature, that environment, and uh, certainly with the enzymes, so the microbes uh, would be, um, yeah, and a good environment to break down PLA. Uh, yeah, about plastics. I definitely. Um, I'm very interested in uh, doing some evaluation. Thank you. Yeah, next, if you want to come up and introduce yourself. <laughs> and who is your question directed to? Oh, okay. Um, I have two questions. Uh, my name is Michelle Reed, and I'm an environmental scientist with CalRecycle, uh, formerly a PhD student, so glad to see you here. <laughs> um, yeah, so my first question is the, when talking about carbon negative uh, molecules for CMF, um, does, is that including the carb, like the energy intensity um, of creating those particular molecules? Or is that just, and then are you using like an inorganic catalyst or what kind of process are you using? Yeah, so they, they have done, uh, Origin have done a, a life cycle uh, analysis of, of this, and it comes out carbon negative mainly because, um, because there, are, there are energy inputs, okay. you're right, uh, but uh, there is also uh, something called a hydrothermal carbon, so the, the material that doesn't get converted, like especially lignin, right, that doesn't get converted uh, to CMF is, is used to, to, to make uh, something that looks a little bit like activated carbon. Uh, they call it a hydrothermal carbon. And, and that is, is pretty strongly carbon negative, taking carbon um, out of the cycle. So overall, I, and I, I'm not privy to this uh, information, but they've, they've done and they've published the fact that the life cycle analysis shows that their overall process is carbon negative. That's a good question. Yeah, because I worked with Renew CO2, which is kind of similar to Origin, and uh, it wasn't until like you account for using a lot of renewable energy, like solar and wind and all that stuff, where it actually comes out too. But yeah, interesting. Okay, and then my second question has to do with um, the liquid digestate product. Has anyone looked into um, like recovery of like rare earth elements? using microbes, like any bioaccumulation that you can take from it. Like I know there's some uh, work with um, Professor um, Ceci Martinez Gomez at Berkeley, like taking lanthanides from, um, I guess it's like urine samples of people who've gone through chemotherapy. So you can actually harvest those, um, you know, chemical uh, metals. So I'm interested in this very like nutrient dense you know, liquid, can you actually recover metals? Um, we haven't looked at that in our project, but I'll defer to Ray Hong if they're doing any of that work. Very, very interesting. Um, I will be, I will start to recover metals. <laughs> so um, I think our project, uh, especially in the reef facility, would be a perfect facility looking at, especially after we uh, now we have membrane filtration, we're able to collect the microbes into form, yeah, into concentrated form where we could look into uh, these metals. So no, to answer your question, no, we have not really uh, looked at the, we, we measured the heavy metals so the, more for the sake of food crop soil, and uh, but really have not looked into uh, some precious metals or other metals that could have value. Thank you, very interesting. Thank you for the questions. Um, any other members from the audience? I don't see any questions from our online attendees.
Okay, Dan Noble has a question. It's gonna close. Oh, okay. Um, yeah, for Dr. Mescal, um, I didn't really hear what the form of the feedstocks are that you're using in this new facility. Is it just a standard chip and grind biomass or? Yeah, yeah so uh, as long as it has um, carbohydrates in it, you can use it. So uh, you do have to uh, reduce the, the size of it. You can't throw a log in there, right? Mm -hmm. But you reduce the particle size, sort of like uh, chipped. It depends on your mass transfer limitations with the size of your vessel, right? But it, it can be anything from sawdust-like consistency to, to sort of bigger particles. But, but yeah, that's, that, that's what you, you put in. And you call it chemocatalytic. Is there, is there a ca catalyst of any sort? Yeah, it's the simplest catalyst of all. It's, it's the proton. So it's an indestructible catalyst, but it, you, you do catalyze it to the, the dehydration process is catalyzed by acid. So it's, uh, mm -hmm. it's, yeah, it's an indestructible catalyst, HCl. How is that different from just straight acid hydrolysis or is that what it is ultimately? Yeah, yeah. so you have to <laughs> hydrolyze the, so what happens is the cellulose gets hydrolyzed to glucose. The glucose uh, uh, rearranges to uh, in situ to fructose, fructose dehydrates to HMF and HMF. I didn't, I didn't go through all the steps, but right. HMF is substituted by HCl to give CMF and the CMF migrates into the organic layer where it's safe from these decomposition pathways that have plagued CMF production or HMF production, excuse me, for, you know, ever since it's been discovered. So you might've mentioned it in the, um, this, in your presentation, but I probably missed it. Um, this facility that's being built right now and when it gets commissioned, uh, what is its, what is its maximum potential throughput on uh, um, average basis? Yeah, th this is uh, so it it is commissioned. It is, it is working not at full capacity, the, but it, it's it, they're they're actually selling products, CMF products from it. Uh, you know what its actual capacity is? Um, I'm not sure. I, I know that. I know it's it's sort of a small what what they they describe as a small commercial um, uh, facility. Mm -hmm. So their next one is going to be much larger. The one in Louisiana is going to be much larger. That's going to be a full-scale commercial facility. But the actual numbers, I'm afraid I, I, I don't know. Okay. Okay. And I think we, we're at three, but we'll, we'll take one. We only have maybe a minute to answer. If you, want, if you want to ask your last question, we have a final question from Michael Long, independent engineering consultant. Thanks, Hussein. Um, most of my questions were already answered. I'll just go with a quick one to... Uh... Professor of Chemistry related origin materials. Um, this hydrothermal carbon, what fraction ends up as your hydrothermal? Yeah, the, the, so there is a solid fraction at the end of at the end of all of this. So all the lignin that <clears throat> doesn't get converted, and uh, inevitably some carbohydrate uh, is turned into what's called humic material, and that that humic is a, is a, a black solid. And so at the end, you've got something that basically looks like like coffee grounds almost. And uh, that, that is what they call, uh, just put everything under that umbrella term of, of hydrothermal carbons. It still has some oxygen in it, but um, they're using this as a, a source of, uh, of carbon black for tires. So you bake the oxygen out and it's, it's really high activity carbon black. Uh, we've used it to, uh, uh, it has, has good porosity. So we, we've used it as a, a catalyst for, for chemical reactions. It's got what's called mesoporosity, which is unusual. Most things have microporosity. Mm -hmm. So it's a useful substance, but it, of course it's not being burned or used in anything else. So it's, it's kind of a, a sink, a carbon sink. But yeah, it's a good question. I, I didn't really talk very much about it because I didn't really have the time. Sure. But yeah, sure. There might be some interesting follow-up. There's some other work going on. Some other other biomass people are looking at uh, meso and micro carbons for uh, advanced uh, products. For sure. Yeah. No more time. Yeah, we're going to take the break. Um, we do have a open discussion kind of Q and A at the end from four to four forty five, and I, I believe Dan will probably invite any panelists who are still around to come up for that. So there is an opportunity to ask questions from panelists at that time. Um, we will break until 3.15. Thank you. Thank you.
The great thing about this is
when I went in, I, I only saw the one for the SRA position. And Hello, this is Tom.
Um, let me see. I'm not sure. We may be muted. I heard that. Oh, hello. Great. Okay, great. Very nice. All right, everyone. Uh, I think we're minute past uh, three sixteen. We're starting uh, session eight, and I'm just gonna step in quickly to introduce the moderator, Tom McGrath. Um, Tom uh, has worked uh, for more than twenty years, successfully collaborating with diverse stakeholders, working with multimedia departments, breakthrough technologists finance specialists and academic researchers. Tom focuses on wise use of available resources to design sustainable communities today, both for communities and businesses. Tom is CEO of Vital Clean Tech, CSO of bioproducts.center, holds zero waste and sustainable management certification from the California Resource Recovery Association and has presented to California business and government sponsored forums on the topics of organic waste upcycling, including on Los Angeles city, sister city business trips and clean tech trade summits to Sao Paulo, Brazil, Berlin, uh, Germany, and throughout China. All right, Tom, uh, you can go and uh, introduce your speakers. Hello, greetings. Um yeah, this is uh, uh, Tom McGrath. Uh, let me see, I just had a, uh, wanted to, you know, uh, thank the uh, organizing committee uh, again for uh, for another great uh, California Bio Resources Alliance Symposium. Um, and uh, it seems to be a very, you know, successful hybrid uh, symposium this year, uh, in person and remote. Um, it was it was uh, it was great when we were all together in one room, but um, since uh, uh, remote. Um, because of COVID for a number of years, uh, we're um, you know in, in the hybrid space right now. So uh, thank I, I really wanted to to uh, thank everyone, uh, especially Lauren. Uh, thank you for putting this all together and hosting us again uh, from your position there uh, with uh, EPA District Nine, um, and uh, like that. So uh, yeah, we um, you know this session. Uh, um, it's called experiences in bioresources management, and it's really uh, you know kind of a combination of, of uh, looking at how to you know um, how, how do we scale um, you know develop projects and, and manage projects uh, most efficiently um, uh, bioenergy um, biomass bioresource um, bioproducts uh, projects uh, here in California where there's a, a, a um, great opportunity and um, and also a great number of hurdles, which many of the speakers have uh, spoken about. Um, both of those, uh, as far as you know, developing uh, a, a robust uh, circular uh, economy, uh, circular organics economy here in California, uh, the fifth largest um, 
economy in the world. And um, yeah, from CEQA to you know getting dozens and dozens of permits uh, to launch a project, um, to uh, uh, you know uh, successfully uh, you know operating uh, projects for you know for uh, you know often um, two three decades. So wanted to uh, start off a conversation. Um, uh, I believe that uh, Jacob is going to speak first here. Uh, Jacob Collins with Listec. There's two speakers with uh, Listec, and uh, uh, a company that does uh, hydrothermal uh, um, uh, processing. Um, I want to introduce uh, Jacob Collins is the uh, product coordinator for Listec California. Uh, he's been managing biosolids for 15 years, eight of them for Listec International. His background is in environmental science and is a certified crop advisor. He oversees the land application sales and operations, including forecasting, regulatory compliance, managing subcontractors, and public outreach. Um, Jacob, are you uh, at the podium or are you in the room there? Oh, great, thank you, Kevin. Perhaps Nayeli is going to speak first. If I can see the uh, rearranging the, the deck chairs there. Good afternoon, everyone. Ne so, ne Avery, ne Nayeli, is it possible that, that I could introduce you? Yes. Okay, great. Thank you. Uh, yeah, Nayeli uh, uh, Basolto is, is the plant manager for Listec International uh, US. Nayeli is a graduate of University of California Merced, environmental engineering. Nayeli is a lead for uh, facility upgrades and product quality. Her work uh, effort ensures that organic material um, recovery center operations are efficient and effective, meeting customer expectations. She supports the operations team by analyzing data and implementing adjustments to uh, for continuous process improvement. Nelly also manages various permit requirements, uh, which are assigned to the OMRC. Thank you, Nelly. Thank you. So a brief overview on Listec. So Listec uses a thermohydrolysis process technology that hydrolyzes biosolids and organic material. And, um, and our, we are located in Fairfield, California, and we receive biosolids from different wastewater treatment plants and organic material from Budweiser. Um, the material is then processed using a THP technology reactor, and the outcome is a hydrolyzed liquid fertilizer. And the liquid is low in viscosity and has a percent solids range between 10 and 12 percent solids. And then this is stored in the reservoirs that we have, and it's the third picture that you see on the screen. And we land apply the liquid fertilizer in agricultural land. We have another location in Dundalk, Ontario, Canada. And their technology is slightly different than ours. Their setup is slightly different than ours. Their plant first opened in 2012. And once we saw what aspects were efficient and which ones weren't, we approached our technology method differently in Fairfield when we opened up in 2016. No. So the first picture that we have here is from Dundalk and how they currently have their setup is that the incoming biosolids um, truck backs up the truck into the storage area and they offload the biosolids on the ground and then an operator has to wash off the truck's wheels before leaving the site. And the truck's wheels are washed off so that way they don't leave smear tracks of biosolids on the road. And then another operator has to then pick up the biosolids using a loader and they drop the material into a hopper, which then gets treated via the THP technology. And on average, this whole process takes around 30 to 35 minutes from when the truck scales in, dumps the material and then scales out. 
And this requires more operators, it's more time consuming and it's more tedious and messy work. And there's a safety risk of possibly slipping on the wet floor. <coughs> and on the other hand, this picture is from Fairfield, California. And how we have our setup is that the biosolids truck backs up their truck into the receiving pit and an operator washes off the truck, as you can see in the first image on the left. And then we use automated augers to move the material from the receiving pit into the storage bin. So the picture in the middle is the augers, it moves the material from left to right, and it makes its way into the storage bin. And on average, this whole process takes around 20 minutes from when the inbound truck scales in, dumps the material and scales out. So as you can see, having a receiving pit and automated augers helps fasten the process to unload a truck. And this means that we could um, assist more trucks per hour and overall throughout the day because it's less time wasted per cycle. And in both locations in Dundalk and Fairfield, we use a SCADA system to help with the daily operations of the processing the biosolids. And the system is all automated. So for example, we could change the dosage of water or alkali product or the pump speed straight from the SCADA system. And we do have operators who do routine checks on pumps, motors, and augers, but other than that, the system runs on its own. And we do have an operator in the office who oversees and manages the system to see if the system is running smoothly. And once the material is fully processed and stored, it gets sent to agricultural fields. And this is where Jacob will take over to talk about the technology efficiencies when land applying in the fields. Thank you, Nayeli. So our beautiful facility was constructed in 2016. And in 2017, we started to go to land application. Land application, we started off with truck tankers. Uh, they're built about 6,000, 6,500 gallons to go out to the field to unload. And then I have a tractor in the field with an injector that can upload the material or vacuum off the material from the frack tank and go directly to the applicator, then go in the field. When I first set up the program, my tractor, my operator, and my injector were the most expensive piece of equipment out there. So I try to make sure that guy was running consistently all the time and make sure that there was product always on hand for him to go. That's why I set up a frack tank up there so I can have two tanks offload at once and have material always in there ready for the tractor to run. This was really good at keeping the tractor running. Um, I kept the tractors and everything else rolling, but it was really inefficient and I didn't realize that until I started thinking over the winter time. My hose to unload the offload trucks was three inches and you can see it in the bottom right hand corner. They were unloading in about 40 minutes and that's just way too long for land app. Um, also take that frack tank from field to field was also another piece of equipment that was bulky, heavy. And I had to get another piece of tractor out there to get him to move it out there. And depending on the size of your fields, you could move once or twice a day or once or twice a week, depending on, you know, if you're in a 50 acre field or a 400 acre field. So I decided to retrofit the tankers and I put straws in them. This is the top of one of the tanks. Um, I put an, um, it's an air actuated hatch on it too. So the truck drivers wouldn't have to go up on top and open up the hatches anymore. Uh, so we go on the side of the truck, push a button, opens up, that opens up, liquid's ready to go. Um, the hose that we offload the trucks is an eight inch hose. So I went from a three inch to an eight inch hose. So I offloaded trucks. It went from 45 minutes down to about six. And the tractor was always moving. He was never stopped. And it kept the trucks moving a little bit faster and it kept the rotation going a little bit better. Um, and it increased our safety because I didn't have truck drivers climbing up and down on top of my trailers anymore. The next efficiency that we did the following year was increase the size of the tanker in the field. I went from a 6,500 to a 7,500. Um, the Lissagro material, once we blend it and liquefy it again, 
kind of acts like a soda can depending sometimes the year when it's warmer it expands a little bit when it's colder it shrinks when you shake it up it kind of does different things so when i increase the volume of our offloading i was able to get two more tons out per truckload that was pretty good when you're doing 40 to 60 truckloads a day so that was in 2019 and we've been doing it that way since then so 2019 20 21 22. So we increased the amount of material that we're able to offload. We've been increasing um, the time that it takes to offload. So it's decreasing. So we're able to do more material per day. And with those two things, we had really, really big efficiency wins. And that's the kind of way that we've been running our program and we're still looking for efficiency wins. Also with our injector, we have GPS guidance and flow control. We got a noon or a crone flow meter on a six inch line off the top that regulates how much material is going out the injectors on the back. We have a GPS guidance there that shows a map where you're going on the field. The tractor almost drives itself. You just push a button, the operator gets in it and it goes. Operator has to sit there with a joystick and offload it with the boom and stuff like that. But otherwise it's a pretty simple system to operate once you get it all set up. Um, it's accurate, it's precise. Operators, very easy to understand. Field on the right was applied with Lissa Road. The field on the left was commercial. The cool thing about our equipment, since we have GPS guidance and flow control, is that you got a really even rate now that you're going out in the field. You don't have this going on with your fields anymore with broadcasting or spreading and inconsistencies. You got a really nice even path that's going out there, and you can see it by the yields. Um, a lot of different things have been, a lot of positive things have been thrown around our program that it's been really nice to hear um, regarding animal unit increases per day, how much weight gain they have, pregnancy rates, a uh, lot of just animal nutrition, less pesticide use, less insecticide use, just all sorts of different things by increasing carbon into the, back into these soil systems. Biosols is a great source of carbon. Our product is about a five to one carbon to nitrogen ratio. For every pound of nitrogen that you're putting down, you're putting down five pounds of carbon. So you're feeding those microbiology bio really well, as well as fertilizing the crops. They're no longer competing for those nutrients and sources. They're, they have a homologous or a, a good synergy again, instead of competing with each other. Um, higher yields, better quality feed. It's been win-win for farmer. And it's a less price per acre than commercial fertilizer. So it's been really easy to market the stuff and really easy to get these guys on board year after year after year. And when the neighbor comes by and he sees a field going like this, he's automatically signed up in the program and it's been taken off. I've been sold out ever since we've been producing it. And our equipment and everything's so easy that Berber and Arbor can operate the equipment. Uh, that's kind of how we're doing with efficiencies and technology at Listech. And if anybody has any questions, let us know. Thank you. Great. Uh, thank you, Colin. Uh, uh, Jacob Collins, I mean, uh, I appreciate that. And um, yeah, I think we'll save our, our questions uh, uh, to, to uh, toward, towards the end, um, if that's okay. Um, we have our uh, next uh, presenter is uh, Chad White. Uh, Chad is uh, the project manager for the Marin Biomass Project. Yeah, in this role, he is responsible for day-to-day -day management of a grant agreement with the Governor's Office of Planning and Research that is part of the Woody Feedstock Aggregation uh, Pilot Program. He's also a technical uh, contributor to the program based on his work in the environmental management and regional planning uh, related to SB 1383. Chad has worked as a sustainability strategist for petite firms in the private and nonprofit sectors and as a consulting engineer for the private and public sector uh, clients. He holds a PhD in environmental science and management from UC Berkeley and a BS in chemical engineering from the University of Michigan. Um, Chad, uh, thank you so much for joining us uh, on, on Zoom today. Well, thanks for having me. Um, I will say upfront that the presentation that we just had was uh, more about a system op optimization for a particular technology. And what I'm going to do is zoom out a bit and talk about an effort that could be called an optimization. I'm not going to use that word, looking at biomass management at the county level. 
And I will apologize to my uh, co-panelists because I'm not going to name their technology when I talk about, but that doesn't have uh, doesn't reflect anything on um, our enthusiasm about what they're doing. So I'll start by saying the Marin Biomass Project is a biomass utilization project based in Marin County, uh, which is the county just north of San Francisco on the end of the Golden Gate Bridge. The purpose of the project is to spur sustainable the sustainable development of a biomass recovery and utilization system, but the underlying goal or the leitmotif of the story is the movement of carbon from areas of high risk to high reward. Examples of higher risk in terms of what I'm suggesting, uh, forested lands with risk of wildfire that is higher than historical norm, <clears throat> or landfills with organic carbonaceous materials decomposing in them. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, examples of higher reward, uh, recovered building materials that retain carbon or milling of timber from wildfire prevention activities or conversion of woody biomass into biochar. And addition of biochar or composting materials to soils, particularly depleted agricultural soils. So in the next roughly 15 minutes, I wanna summarize this effort to build a countywide biomass recovery platform and synergistic utilization strategy. And with some sincerity and vulnerability to invite your ideas for narrating this kind of work to increase its relatability, transferability, and diffusion. The Marin Biomass Project is an outgrowth of several initiatives in Marin County in California. About 15 years ago, the Marin Carbon Project was launched to evaluate science-based agricultural practices that reduce greenhouse gases or increase soil carbon content. A little over six years ago, the legislature passed SB 1383, which as many of the participants here know, uh, is designed to reduce short-lived greenhouse gas emissions by diverting organics materials from landfill. About four years ago, Marin County passed Measure C to reduce wildfire risk and in so doing established uh, a joint powers authority called the Marin Wildfire Prevention Authority and an annual fund of $20 million. And also, uh, just a little over three years ago, the legislature passed SB 85, which is a supplemental budget act that funds wildfire, wildfire prevention activities, including the five regional biomass feedstock aggregation uptake projects, of which Burn Biomass Project is one, under what is called the Woody Feedstock Aggregation Pilot Program. Each of these policies relates to a kind of biomass and biomass flow. The Marin Carbon Project is an effort to examine them together and look for a sustainable development synergy among them. For carbon farming, this means material flows off of agricultural lands, such as, as manures from dairy operations, and also flows back uh, to range and ranch lands. For a landfill diversion, it means the organics that SB 1383 is spurring from landfill. Uh, for illustrative purposes, because the list is obviously quite a bit longer, Three relevant kinds are urban woody biomass, food scraps, and yard trimmings from residences and commercial businesses. And for wildfire prevention, it means brush and smaller and larger diameter biomass, a lot of which might show up as chipped biomass. The Marine Carbon Project, I mean, the Marine Biomass Project, rather, has received a $750,000 grant from the Governor's Office of Planning and Research to look at these types of biomass jointly based on the recognition that much of the woody biomass for wildfire prevention in the kind of urban coastal region where Marin sits has its readiest disposition through the resource recovery system developing in response to SB 1383. So the goal of this effort is to develop recommendations that can help the county see and capitalize on the use of the biomass and to do so in a way that provides the best chance for local economic development and greenhouse gas reduction. And to dream a little bit big, um, our ambition needs to have no upper bound. So for this analysis, we strive to imagine a biomass recovery system that does more than offer the least cost increments to waste diversion and recycling. We're trying to imagine one where uh, a local infrastructure that minimizes transportation distances, facilitates green and high road jobs, produces products of local value, um, and potentially uh, isn't just a cost center for the public sector. Zooming out, the Marin Biomass Project has two primary undertakings. The first is the, our biomass utilization study. That's an integrated assessment of biomass flows to aid countywide planning and economic development. This is being undertaken to make recommendations about how best to use these combined biomass streams. And the second is an implementation collaborative that's been formed with key stakeholders to discuss the study's recommendations and try to jumpstart their uh, implementation. And in particular, the thing that I think about a lot is how this facilitates capital investment 
and economic development, um, looking at some of the pathways that are the best fit for Marin. The study is a five-part assessment of the recovery of biomass shed. The first part uh, assesses the amount, type, and timing of different types of biomass. The second part looks at matching technologies to that biomass to see what, uh, what looks like um, a good fit. The third part evaluates uh, biomass flows and technologies and these pathways uh, for greenhouse gases. And then the fourth part looks at them uh, in terms of the finance and the business models that can make that work. And then the whole thing is designed to roll up into recommendations for key public and private um, stakeholders. Uh, we have drafted parts A and B. Um, part C is uh, underway as is part D. So I don't have results from the study to show you, I think in another year. Um, that would be possible. So today I'm just talking about what we're doing um, and then looking at uh, a bit more of um, how to talk about this. Um, this project started three years ago. Um, a group got together in the summer of 2020 and submitted the funding proposal to OPR in 2021, selected for funding, and the study launched uh, about a year ago. We're now about uh, one year into our study. We've got about a year left to go. Um, the key point is that the project doesn't stop with the study. Um, the, the project is also working to implement recommendations through technical assistance, implementation assistance, and joint institutional planning. So one thing that we've done um, is to form what we call the Marin Biomass Collaborative. The brown circle on the left are the people who are running the project. The PM stands for project manager, that's me, and then a group of people form the steering committee. And then there's a wider group of people uh, that we've invited in representing the public sector, people who are in the agricultural space, people who are in the land management and firefighting space, and people who are in the resource recovery space to try to get them to think jointly about uh, what we're looking at. We have about three dozen knowledgeable stakeholders that help us review data and findings and recommendations. And we look at these as a network of people or kind of a team that can work together to solve the problem of getting to act on the recommendations. So one of the uh, things that the part we're trying to do is form a common language with them, with them and align objectives. And an exciting aspect of the project is the kind of uncommon conversations that it is uh, uh, stimulating. So we have foresters talking with wastewater treatment plant managers. We have zero waste managers talking with agricultural representatives and so on. So it's, it's not uh, typical for those folks to know each other, at least not in Marin. Um, and we think that that kind of crosstalk is one of the, one of the elements that can help move things forward. So once our study completes in um, beginning next year into 2025, we'll be looking at um, institutional cooperation that helps to establish the recovery platform, meaning we get a lot of the public sector uh, key stakeholders on the same page. And uh, we uh, have models for filling in the infrastructure gaps and funding them um, and getting biomass contracts in place that will really help flow materials. Okay, so that's technically what we're doing, but the thing I wanted to focus on a little bit today um, <laughs> is the story that um, is being told by this project. In part, it's a science-based planning study, um, but we think for this to really make an impact, it needs to be a story. And the question is, what's what's the story that we can tell here? A narrative framework that we can draw from, and you've heard me mention a couple times, is sustainable development. Um, I, you know, it's a bit of a jargony framework and it's not a widely shared discourse and it's hard to capture public imagination with it. So we want to tell a story that's compelling and engaging and stimulating, uh, one that motivates decisions and investment in managing biomass. So I'd like to focus the rest of my presentation on laying out kind of a, a concept of a story and invite any of you who have ideas for telling this uh, to even speak up during the Q&A or contact me afterwards. I, I really do think we could use some help uh, in thinking about how to, to talk about these kinds of projects that we're doing. So I'll start by saying our project is partly a story about forest and woodland ecosystems. Uh, a foundation of the story is a recognition that the ecology of the forested lands of the Western US includes regular burning. It's why redwood trees have such thick bark and few low branches. But over a century preventing forests from burning has left too much dead wood and dry material or what's called fuel in the forest. So it's a story about how fire suppression has led to forest fuel buildup and increasing wildfire risk that's gonna release carbon and has released a lot of carbon. So that uh, another element is the, the climate change story that's dried out the forest and resulted in more tree death. Um, so the catastrophic wildfire pre prevention uh, uh, is, uh, an element of our story. 
and the positive feedback for fire, um, which releases carbon in, um, as greenhouse gases and increases climate change. The landfill diversion element of our project is about economic metabolism, and material habits, about a quality of life that involves, uh, that consumes a range of industrial goods and about discarding consumed goods in landfills. The experiment of throwing everything into the landfill has had some unintended consequences. It's the reason why we have SB 1383. We know that when we put bioresources in landfills, they break down and release greenhouse gases. And just as a point of context, in the Bay Area, more than 50% of methane emissions created by humans emanates from our landfills. So it's uh, it's a big concern and what we're part of the reason we're uh, so jazzed about this, this kind of work. So it's a story about putting things into a renewable cycle affordably and attractively. Part of our story is about seeing these materials as feedstocks in a more circular bioeconomy rather than waste in a pass-through uh, consumptive economy. Um, and the core of the project is exploring the biomass uh, in terms of the kinds of products that could be created out of it. So a core of our effort is figuring out um, different ways that these things can be used. And there are a lot of the technologies that people talk about at the Bioresources uh, Alliance Symposium. Um, here, I'm just going to illustrate seven that we've been looking at uh, to try to understand how the feedstocks at the top could be part of a, a combined system uh, at the bottom, produce different types of goods and products. Um, integral to our exploration of these factors is building our ability to match the flows with utilization options. Um, so we've been doing projection planning um, as well as trying to uh, differentiate the materials to determine which pathways are a good match for new and changing biomass flows in Marin. And the wildfire prevention piece here is a, a key one because that effort's only a couple of years old and really trying to understand how much woody biomass we're talking about and what, what can be done with it is a, um, a, a key a stimulating point here. And I'll, I'll just mention that um, part of our concern of one of the things that motivates this project is a lot of export of biomass out of Marin currently and trying to figure out how to address that. So a key part is looking at these flows jointly um, with that kind of countywide biomass shed of woody, green, and food materials together and considering how they create intersections and coordination need, needs among different institutional actors. So we've, I've already mentioned the Marine Wildfire Prevention Authority, but Zero Waste Marin is our countywide um, material uh, waste planning authority. Um, this project sits within the Marine Resource Conservation District, which is an agriculture support district. We're very interested in working with our local uh, community aggregation energy company, our wastewater districts, as well as the private uh, uh, operators within the resource recovery system and large man, uh, land managers in, in Marin. Um, perhaps most significantly for this group, we're looking at this uh, pathway in terms of their carbon impacts, um, not simply their transportation and processing emissions, but the ability of products to affect greenhouse gas emissions in positive ways like green power. So this is sort of a story about the relative greenhouse gas emissions of transportation production and about the carbon avoidance and sequestration potential of products put to beneficial use. One of those beneficial uses relates to um, the picture that the previous presentation with Blystack brought up is uh, land application. And uh, we are looking at the possibility of that for agricultural operations. Um, so how can we think about the system as generating something that helps to uh, manage their soil and renew its vitality and uh, uh, sustainability? So it's a potential new paradigm that looks to farmers to move carbon into a new compartment in the, the carbon cycle. So it's a story about looking to agricultural lands for their potential as carbon sinks, um, and uh, uh, also a way to uh, replenish and, and nourish the soils. So carbon farming is one of the concepts that is being actively pursued in Marin, and we're looking at uh, intersection points and synergies with that as well. One of our key interests um, is the creation of a system, uh, and I'm going to begin to illustrate it with the next couple of slides, and then this is going to kind of wrap up my, my talk. Illustrated here on the left, the first part of our story and the first chapter of our study is about the biomass feedstocks potentially available. 
and illustrated at the bottom, the second part of our work in the second chapter of our study is about these different pathways that could be available that would fit the marine biomass shed, um, as well as looking at the existing infrastructure and the potential to add infrastructure that would create a set of products that would be uh, beneficial for local use. So it's this is a story about building up the, uh, the nascent biomass utilization activities and really thinking about an, a dynamic economic sector that removes biomass from natural and working lands and recovers it alongside organics and material uh, stream. And then really thinking about uh, the intentional use of it in ways that can reduce greenhouse gases. So the creation of a system that can produce high quality carbon rich soil amendments uh, that not only just scientifically makes sense, but that can garner the trust and confidence of agricultural landowners uh, to be added to land. And uh, the, the ranch lands of West Marin are sensitive places to apply um, materials that have been recovered. And um, we estimate that the agricultural lands in Marin could absorb all of the carbon from biomass flows needing disposition. So this entire system um, and the science of the Marin Carbon Project is showing that added the right way, compost and biochar can have significant, meaningful, long-term carbon storage effects. So making these connections is the goal of the Marin Biomass Project. We're working to build this system. Um, this is our story about trying to uh, move carbon on a county-wide scale from high risk to high reward. Thank you. Thank you, Chad. Um, yeah, great. Thank you very much. That was, that was a great presentation. And uh, let me see, I just uh, had a couple of, uh, uh, well, I, I want to see if there's any in, in room uh, questions. I have some comments. Oh, hi, uh, Dan Noble. Great. I'm only coming here to uh, help moderate the room, but also uh, transition to the final session. Um, yeah, are, are there any questions from the room before? relative to either of these two uh, presentations and projects. And, okay, and, well, and, I, and I while, while, that, while that's coming together, um, let me see if, uh, if, if there's uh, anyone uh, queuing up, please let me know. Um, but let me see, I, I did have a, um, uh, uh, Chad, thank you for your uh, storytelling. That, that's a very, very nice way of saying it. I really appreciate that, uh, the prelude to it, and then sort of the story of where you're you know, leading towards um, for the bioresources uh, for Marin. Um, you know, very, very exciting. Um, I, I like uh, to touch on a couple of things or uh, just briefly um, from uh, e either Jacob uh, or uh, uh, Nelly, if you can just um, give me a little sense of what the 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 main uh, U.S. and Canada uh, feedstocks are uh, for the biomass, the sources of biomass uh, that you're currently using. Biosolids are Bi our current source. Class B mm -hmm. biosolids, not subclass B, class B biosolids or higher, and then other organic streams like uh, food residuals from Budweiser or other beer processors. Okay, great. And then could I summarize your process as a, uh, uh, basically a, um, like a hydrothermal uh, conversion process, like HTC, is it a, uh, like a pressure? It's a thermal pressure? hydrolysis chemical. Right, okay. So a chemical system also, okay. Yeah, so we heat it up, then we dose it with a little bit of uh, potassium hydroxide to right, bring up yeah. the pH and also yeah. to level out the balances of the nutrients. Okay. okay For a nice balanced NPK. Thank yeah, you. I'm curious as to how that's different from <clears throat> the process that uh, Mark was talking about. The yeah, chemical origin. Yeah. Uh, okay, good. Well, let, let's uh, uh, we'll, we'll come back to that. I know you have some people lined up there in the room, um, but I just wanted to just also just touch on, on Chad's uh, fire prevention um, and, um, and and post fire. Um, uh, forest carbon and off gas uh, toxins management uh, for 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 after uh, you know dealing with uh, burned lands and uh, um, you know re recovery um, and prevention of of, of off gassing. Um, I think it's an interesting part of that uh, story as well. Um, so you know, thank you for sharing. I don't know if you have anything to add to that right now, Chad or. 
Well, I might just double down a little bit on what I was saying. I mean, it's interesting to be on a panel with uh, Lysak and, and to think about, you know, what they're doing. And here's, let me tell you a little bit of the motivation of why I talked about what it did. Um, sometimes when you're doing a complicated thing, you want to be able to tell people a lot of details about it. You want to be able to give a 15 or 20 minute presentation that can really kind of drill down. Um, but sometimes you don't have that much. You need to give people like a five minute sales pitch. And yeah, then yeah. there's like the 30 second elevator pitch. And then sometimes you just want to tell people what it is in a few words. And um, so, you know, not to be totally crass, but like, you know, if I were talking about life and really trying to boil it down, it's like turning poop into fertilizer. You know, it's like a kind of lay way of talking about it. Having been involved with the symposium for a while, I, I think that there's a real question about how we engage um, wider groups of people in this discussion and really get them to start spending some money um, on getting behind a lot of the good work that people here are talking about and and trying to figure out how to boil that down. Like, I think I can give a 20 minute presentation. I think I can give three words We're in the Marine Biomass Project. It's hard to get to those other things. And I'm trying to think about how you get to kind of scalable stories in a way that work for different audiences. And I, I find it tricky in the space. Um, so I've, you know, that's, that's a lot of what I'm thinking about as well as the, the technical details and the technologies. Sure. And a lot of these are, you know, ultimately going to be public-private partnerships when you talk about experiences in bio-resource uh, management, um, you know, here in California is, is how are these projects going to, you know, uh, scale? And it, it, uh, public sector finance, um, um, you know, uh, government uh, programs, you know, there, there's a number of different carrots and sticks uh, that, that can help shape uh, the development of, of many of these resources. Um, so thanks, uh, Dan, is there someone there uh, in the room with a couple of questions before your Q&A or does this sort of lead right into your Q&A? Hello, yes. Michael Wong with Wong Thermochemical. First, a uh, quick uh, comment to Chad. Appreciate the the story concept. Yeah, completely agree. Trying to, I would think all of us in the in these fields trying to explain to anyone what's really happening. It's different levels of resolution. Um, but my real question is more towards a uh, life stick. Life stick. Liz Tech. Sorry, I'm completely out of my element um, with your field. Anyways. Just curious about uh, the markets. Um, I assume your plant is always at full capacity and you have secure feedstock contracts. I don't know how much you're willing to share, but somewhat curious about how feedstock contracting works with that. Was it contracted out the way the brewery industry usually does contracts where it's 20 year contracts? Is it just your projections assume that there's gonna be plenty? Anything you could say on that would be appreciated. Thank you. We're the sixth plant. Um, we have five other ones in Canada. There's another one in UAE, another one in Kansas, and a couple more that are in the pipeworks being built. James Dunbar, my boss, he would be able to explain contracts to you a little bit more. Um, right now, I think we'll be in Fairfield for the next 25 years. So without long-term contracts, the private side wouldn't really come in with the capital to back it up as much as I know on it. Um, but Jim would be able to tell you more about contracts and how he secures those. Fair enough, thanks. Yeah, the Fairfield facility, I, I happened to make, be um, go to the opening and it was, a, and it is a public-private partnership, correct? It is. With the Fairfield system. And we do make life. other things besides fertilizer. We have list of carb, we have a carb source. We also have a list of mice that we introduce material back to the digest or make bi more biogas. So we do have a couple other products besides fertilizer. Thank you. Great. Um, so yeah, go, comparing and contrasting these two two stories, the Listec story, uh, which is national, and then the Marin story, which is very regional to one county. Um, th that's a lot of what this whole symposium is about. And in the sense of how do we, um, at different scales of investment, how do we work together at the local level? And that's, that's part of our challenge. And I know you're, you're actually, uh, what I noticed from your presentation, as well as from the original uh, RFP from a year ago on the Marin project, um, that you kind of introduced an, a new concept, new to me anyway, in terms of uh, the pathways 
uh, Chad, the pathways concept, which sounds like a very common word, but you were looking and you had it in charts, the pathway from the origin of the material to the tech, through the technology to the eventual utilization of it to close the loop. So um, how we have that discussion across disciplines within a given county is part of the challenge here. And I think that's one of the main reasons for this symposium. I, you know, yeah. you helped us or organize the symposium, the last one we had in person before, before COVID. So, um, <coughs> so you understand what we're trying to do here. Yeah, you know, I, I think about these things, you know, the, the question about contracting, I think, is key. Um, you know, if you're going to get the public sector to contract differently about some of these things, they need to be able to understand better where things are going and what the benefits are. And I could call what we're doing trying to understand supply chains, but it's a little bit more than that. It's about trying to understand where the carbon goes and how to get it to go to the right places. And that's part of the reason why we in thinking about conversion technologies and the products they can uh, produce and potentially the markets they can go to and uses, we decided to think about pathways and that's part of the effort to kind of explain what's going on, get different people talking about it and getting, when I talk about recovery platform, it's getting the public sector actors on the same page and able to be literate with one another about what's going on so that they can, as part of the public, um, uh, financing strategy and also the procurement strategy, see what's happening and, and be able to align with not just, uh, I think, successful venture under the SB 1383 framework, um, but also really be capable of, of carbon management at the same time. And it's it's a lot. I mean, we're, we're evolving as we're doing the project. Um, we didn't start off really thinking about uh, our project all the way through the idea of doing um, uh, addition of recovered products to land, uh, but because we've got a strong connection to agricultural districts, we're doing that. We're really just trying to think about how do you understand everything that's going on within a county and try to get the county aware of how best to spend its money and how best to capitalize um, the kind of synergistic system that I think this conference and um, a lot of people's work is really based to, to inspire. Great. Um, why don't we transition here and we'll continue the conversation with everybody. If you, uh, Chad, can stay on and, uh, and um, yeah, and, and Tom as well. And, and Mark, would you be willing to come up here and kind of represent? And, and can we bring um, Ruhang in as well? And this will be our final panel, kind of split between in-room and virtual. Yeah, Dan, this is this is this is great. And you guys it ties in. Um, stay here too, uh, if you're willing. <laughs> Dan, go ahead. Uh, yeah, I was just going to say that this really ties in. Um, you know, from the from the county to the state to you know country to global. You know, with the with the um, the the uh, launch of uh, COP twenty eight um, uh, in in Dubai. I guess it's starting this hour, and. Um, yeah, so it's it's really a, a global you know effort on many levels. Um, how do we manage uh, you know um, hydrocarbons, um, and can we make them biocycle hydrocarbons, uh, carbon and hydrogen? So it's uh, you know it's pretty 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 exciting times. Uh, thanks again for uh, organizing the conference. Sure, um, I'd, I'd like to can part of part of the what what. Um, Chad referred to as, as um, scalable stories, it means that we kind of go beyond our, and all of us do this. I mean, we can think globally and act locally, which was like, again, that was the slogan of Earth Day 1970. So, it's, and, and here we are 53 years later, still trying to do that. And, um, and, and so that to me is a scalable story down to how do you put the product on the field? You said you were selling out, you know, uh, in the Listec product. Yeah, so. Yeah, I've been very fortunate. I haven't given anything away. It's gone as soon as we make it. Right, 
And, and what, what I've noticed about the, the circular economy in the bioresources arena, it's not just carbon, although that seems to be our focus, it's carbon, but um, a number of you mentioned and uh, Ruang, I'm not seeing Ruang on here yet. Oh, she hasn't turned on her, did he? Oh, okay, there she is. Uh, hey, Ruang. Um, you had talked about uh, biofertilizer, and that's a word that has cropped up in our symposia conversations, but you know it's basically nutrient management. And then of course, shot through and through with all of our discussions is, um, is water management, both water utilization as well as water in the product and how much water is there and how much are you transporting. I know the Listec product is, you know, your percent solids in that product is what, um, 10, five or 10%? 10 to 12, so 10 it's 12. High, it's very watery. Yeah. It's liquid by design, so we can subsurface inject it. Yeah. But we can also do other things with it that we're working on currently. I can't discuss. Sure. And and one of the things I didn't understand about the chem, the uh, catalytic, um, what did you call it, chemocatalysis, I, I didn't understand the difference between the technology that you were sharing with us, Mark, versus the Listec technology. I, I think there's a pretty big, pretty big difference in, in that we are making this intermediate, this chemical intermediate that mm -hmm. is, is used for, for making plastics and making fuels and, and uh, other industrial chemicals dyes, as I, as I pointed out. So it's, it's significantly different. It's a single molecule, a single yeah, compound. Yeah, it's a chemical rather than um, what the other fellow... Yeah, it's a it's a pure chemical though. Yeah, so that comes from the carbohydrates and the cellulose. Yeah, and I know that uh, Jim, if he's listening or listening, um, he and I have had conversations over the last year about the concept of what the, he's referring to as liquid compost. And I have other composters who are who are talking about that. I mean, there's compost teas, and you know, which is a heavy water based product. Um, and, you know, most of living chemistry have, takes place in an aqueous solution because that's the way life works. But um, so I think, you know, part of the scalability is also the complexity of not just thinking about or concerning ourselves with the carbon, but with the nutrients and with the water and then between all the communities. I mean, to me, that's even though we're in our 18th year of this symposium. It feels like we have a lot of the same problems of how do we talk to each other through this complexity. We're still competing businesses too at the same time. Exactly. We're all working towards the same goal by being good environmental representatives, but we also are trying to make a dollar out of it at the same time. Um, these global positions, we're all on the global scale acting locally. Um, but UC Davis with their digester, I don't know much about their project. And I'm only in Fairfield. It, <laughs> right. It's hard to realize all these projects that are going on in so many different areas. There's a lot of different work groups. I I follow the Compost Council, mm -hmm. uh, the Marin Carbon Project. I follow John Wick around. I try to implement as much as I can from all the good resources that he does for everything. I'm very thankful for Lauren Pondall and everything she does for the bio resources in California, um, but with all the technology and all the information out there, with it not being organized, without the public being really brought into it, the public doesn't think about their waste. They flush down the toilet, they throw things in the trash, it's out of the sight, out of their mind. They don't mm -hmm. worry about it. It would be nice if more Californians were interested in what happens with their carbon footprint, but I don't think people are really worried about it right now as much as they are uh, about the inflation and other worries that are out there. Right. And, and we talk, I mean, we have a standing education working group in, in our association and that's head, headed up by one of the presenters today, uh, Dr. K, uh, Craig Kalaji, who's got a PhD in soils, but it tries to educate people at all levels. And um, it has to be ultimately part of the culture. And that was one of the, questions I had for you, Chad, is as you're putting together this 
um, Marin Biomass Collaborative. And right now it's a project, as you said, funded through, um, I guess it's the governor's office. Uh, and um, how does that become transportable to all other counties? And are there some frameworks that you see growing out of your project that will be uh, transferable to all of the other counties? And that's related even to our first presentations in the day about um, implementing SB 1383 in terms of procurement, which is the endpoint, but it's also about how do you weave together those pathways? And that has to happen in the community. And it, right now it's like you, you're pointing out, it's not because the waste system is, we kind of think of it as separate from our lives. And as long as somebody picks up our trash and our toilets don't back up, we're good. Yeah. Yeah, you, you know, I, I will say, system? yeah, thanks, Dan. Uh, you know, I, I think um, one of the obligations I feel as a recipient of a, a grant in a, uh, from the state is to come up with the most transferable lessons possible. This wasn't, the intention is not for us to simply solve Marin's problems, but to figure something out that can work um, in a wider range of places statewide. So um, I mentioned that we're one of five pilots. The thing that makes us a little different is that we're in a more urbanized and more coastal um, and a less densely forested part of the state. And yet we still have some of the same problems with um, the wildfire concerns. In fact, like having a huge wildfire um, in the Bay Area could be incredibly expensive. Um, we, uh, w there's a group that uh, is, looks at the forested lands in San Mateo County, um, Santa Clara County and Santa Cruz County. So those all touch each other. They're down on the south side of San Francisco Bay. Uh, having a catastrophic, catastrophic wildfire there that does a lot of property damage could be enormously expensive. Those are, um, according to news stories in the last year, the three most expensive property counties in the state. And so what are we learning how we're gonna transfer to them? And I, I think part of it, uh, and I, I hesitate to say this because I, I know it can sound um, a bit idealistic, but uh, we need to be talking to each other. I need to talk to them and explain things we're doing. We need a way to, uh, to export our lessons. But we need a kind of literacy um, that's shared among some of the different partners as well. I, I do think that part of what we're trying to establish in our project, and I, it's too early for me to say how I think we're going to solve the problem in Marin and what it would look like in other places, but how do you get the waste management authorities who think about SB 1383 to also be thinking about the carbon management opportunities in agricultural districts and also to understand that part of what they're receiving uh, and will be receiving increasingly is materials as, uh, that are the result of wildfire prevention. Um, and and, I, and I'll, start, I'll just say there's a lot of stuff that hasn't been solved. There's still a lot of people who are taking chipped materials and organics and using them as ADC and landfills. We haven't really rounded the corner on that. How do you get people to start uh, being aware of some of the old uh, regulatory framework language and move into the new? And uh, I don't, I think a, a conference like this is enormously helpful. It's part of how I entered the space. Um, and I think that whether we um, just look at the conference in total or we look at individual panels as doing it, that's part of what I'm trying to think about is really how do we, how do we develop literacy um, and how do we think about uh, creating the narrative frameworks that allow people to start understanding what each other are doing and doing joint planning and investment together. I mean, again, exactly. part, of my, uh, part, part of my thinking about this project, part of what I saw as I was working as a regional planner looking at SB 1383 was that um, the public sector doesn't want to spend money on stuff they don't have to if it's going to cause them to raise rates and they can't explain what they're doing. And um, the private sector, uh, you know, uh, to the point about contracts, doesn't want to do things if they can't get a long term contract. Um, so if you have a lot of things starting, and I'll just tell you, like the wildfire prevention activities in Marin are currently being managed with one-year contracts. That's not reliable for the people who want to build biomass management facilities. So we need to get them to extend their contracts much longer so we can help systematize and make their biomass flows a lot longer, or a lot more predictable. And we also need to work with some people and help hedge their risks so that they won't 
uh, stall out and not invest if they can't get a 10 year contract right away. So there's some, there's a, there's a bridging of risk there. And I think you can only really get people to do it if they really kind of understand what each other are doing or are speaking the same other language. We have a question, another question or comment in the room. Go ahead. Remind us your name and your company again. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Julie Berry from Bioenergy DevCo. I'm stepping back a bit to what you mentioned earlier, Dan, with respect to nutrient management, water management, and in the more narrowly focused arena of um, permitting hurdles. So for instance, with, with Listec and land application, did you find that there were any issues with um, the ag community needing to amend their nutrient management plans? And then all of the monitoring and reporting that goes into that with the land application of your product? No, they handle it just like they do their fertilizer plants now. So it was easy segue yep. for them. Yeah, just like their UAN 32 or mm -hmm. whatever commercial fertilizer they're using. We okay. send out a fertilizer report, an agronomy report, and they just send that right in to them. And then for, for, for Listec and Reed with stormwater management, I noticed that at least partially uh, the, the offloading of the feedstock is happening outside. And so there's some- uh, On a wastewater treatment plant site. So the wastewater treatment plant is permitted. So we're underneath their stormwater permit plan. Their sweat plan. Oh, okay. So that was so, so at your facility with that truck, the at our facility truck. up in Dundalk, that's underneath their Canadian sweat plan. So they have their own sweat plan up there for that. Okay. So you're but it's all indoor too. That's why they wash it off and everything else before they go outside. Mm -hmm. So we don't have any tracking. And then with the the reed, I noticed that the the material seemed to be on the ground for a little bit before making its way indoors. So I didn't know if there was any kind of stormwater hurdles that you ran into. Well, uh, I can uh, speak. So um, while it is on the concrete pad, uh, so the whole area is, uh, uh, is washed, uh, cleaned uh, each day. And definitely there is a stormwater management uh, plan uh, in place. And uh, so if you wanted to know details and uh, Joe, uh, is the one manager, so he will be able to provide details. But the um, it, there's no storage, open storage. Um, yeah, so whatever comes in each day has to be loaded into digester, cleaned up. That pad needs to be cleaned up. Thank you. I had a question about that facility in terms of the bigger picture. Is that facility wrong? Um, the UC Davis Reed is is that a um, both a production and a research facility? I mean, it's not there just to produce energy from food scraps, which it sounds like you have uh, you're using it as a kind of reference facility and research facility. How long do you plan to be operating that facility if that's the case? So it is a full scale um, operation. And uh, we do, uh, it does provide the uh, research. Uh, it's a, yeah, so it's, a, it's another research facility living off a grant. So, so it's actually operate managed as a, a full scale commercial facility. And, but does uh, uh, provide the <clears throat> teaching research functions. And uh, so the projects comes and go, but even without the, projects or research projects and that facility is managed as a commercial full-scale facility. Yeah, and, and that's one of the other things about speaking of a narrative. Uh, right. I put it in a slide this morning in terms of trying right. to get a context because I've spent the last 20 years trying to get a context of this industry. And I came from the water and wastewater industry as an industry analyst. So uh, but I realize now it's m less about analysis, although that's a huge part of it. It's more about these cross-discipline and integrated discipline relationships ongoing, because we're never going to stop pooping. We're never going to stop wanting to grow more trees and, and concern ourselves with fire management and natural working lands and manure management in our food system. 
I mean, this is a permanent part of our economy as we're transitioning away from waste to something that is regenerative and sustainable or circular, whatever terminology we want to use. Um, and, and so it is a, it's an ongoing conversation. But one of the things that I ha have that I'm challenged with in our industry is number one, it's relatively low value, say compared to software or movies or you know the, the information industry, because we're very tangible industry and it's part of our food system and nobody wants to pay a whole lot more for food, and yet we're willing to pay more for the internet and for entertainment and you know the other as well as healthcare. So, and, and, and in every given community, we have these hybrid economics. It's not a totally planned community, although the pathways idea is to be that way. It's also not a um, you know, strictly private sector because as you've already said, and we all know you need long-term contracts to make it worthwhile to the private sector because you can't just go on a year you know, this is a property-based economics. And then it's also a, mut a municipality service. You know, the public utilities are all engaged in this because they're the ones putting out the contracts based on user fees. So it's, it's, it's pretty complex. And I know that in our county, we're still not talking to the economic development department within the county on an ongoing basis. They're not part of the waste, this discussion. So they're trying to bring in other, you know, economics to the county, whether it's tourism or I live in Sonoma County. So the wine industry has a huge footprint. Um, so how do we have that discussion as well? Maybe this stuff can be brought up when the general plan comes up when the counties, you know, that's the second time I've heard that. And I think the last time I heard it was a couple of years ago, but you're absolutely right. The general plan, this needs to be worked into. Are you guys working that in, uh, Chad, into the general plan of uh, Marin County? <clears throat> That's a difficult question, Dan. There is just <laughs> stuff that ends up on the, there's stuff that ends up on the cutting room floor. So while we're not yeah. engaged with the planning mm -hmm. process, part of the idea of localizing some of the biomass management and potentially building new infrastructure has a lot to do with the, the zoning plans of the county and where there's a, available spaces. So I right. do expect that eventually we'll have feedback, like everything else, like we have a project that we modestly decide to undertake for a couple of years and we've gotten to extend it, but this is this is a sustained effort. Like it's gonna take um, a long time to get this done. And when I'm thinking about this, I'm thinking in the time frame of like, what can we accomplish in our study? And what's a quick win we can get out the door? What are some things we can do right away? And there are some that we're identifying, right. but a lot of this, it's going to take us, uh, I, let me just say, I try to ask people to think about what the system should look like in 2030 and then start building the path to get us there. And some of that right. undoubtedly has to involve various departments, uh, including with the county department. I'm Great. Planned, I'm yeah. sorry. We have other questions, yeah. Good. Just two questions for Dr. Edelati. Uh, uh, the bioterophthalate, uh, those plastics, uh, are they recyclable? We, um, we, did, we had a uh, session with uh, Senator Allen, who sponsored uh, Senate Bill 54. And uh, the Cal Recycle is going to strictly define what's recyclable and what's compostable. And uh, would, would that bio or that bio drive plastic meet? Uh, uh, recyclable or degradable? Yeah, so it is absolutely identical to the one that's produced from uh, petroleum. Absolutely identical. So it's the same same degree of recyclability. Um, it's it's it is what we call a drop in because it drops directly into the infrastructure. So um, since PET is pretty much the most recycled plastic, I, I guess the answer would be yes. Okay, thank you for yeah. clarifying that. And then the uh, the second question is just like as you did with the slide where you just best case scenarios for everything for the production of the the, the fuel. What do you imagine being like the maximum that the the world could produce uh, to relative to like current demand for liquid fuels? 
could it meet everything? Or? Yeah, I mean, that's a great question. It comes up a lot, you know, how, how much biomass is there, you know, compared to the amount of petroleum that we get through and, um, you know, the modern demand for, for materials, for fuels. And um, the, they came out with something called the Billion Ton Vision Report, probably more than more than a decade ago, which suggested that you could meet a significant amount of the demand through through biomass. And um, <clears throat> this idea, which I, I guess is also quite intriguing, of of growing um, uh, biomass on marginal ground that wouldn't wouldn't be competing with food. Uh, is another way, you know, getting energy crops to to do that. You know, uh, I don't know if if anybody's really done the calculation of could could you literally completely do away with petroleum and completely use use biomass for that? That that's still a hard question, but certainly we can make a a pretty significant dent. Uh, and what and what the particular chemistry that you're using? I mean, do do you imagine though that there'd be a limitation? Let's say that there was uh, unlimited feedstock available. It is just like the availability of hydrochloric acid and hydrogen or just the tanks that would be, is there a limit you imagine on what that kind of chemical process could no, be? No, I wouldn't say so because the hydrochloric acid is used in a loop. So, you know, that's just a catalyst and um, you always get, you get that back. The only thing you really are a net producer of is water. You know, mm -hmm. you produce a significant amount of water from, from dehydrating the carbohydrates. Mm -hmm. um, so there's no formal waste stream in, in that process. Um, so yeah, I'd say, I'd say you could, uh, if, if you had an infinite amount of, of capital, <laughs> you know, you could make all your jet fuels and, all, and a lot of your plastics and other, other industrial chemicals from, from that process. Right. Well, thank you. That's very encouraging. Thanks. Yeah, and there, just as, as a footnote to that, the only book where I'd heard that first or seen that first calculation being done is Amory Lovin's book, um, Reinventing Fire, which came out, I think, 20 years ago. Actually, I, I, had a, I had a signed copy of that, but I lost it in the fire up here because <laughs> I, I moved into um, uh, Coffee Park and we were burned out in the Tubbs fire. And I lost my whole library there, but... I've been replacing it, mostly with audiobooks now, though. <laughs> um, more. Oh, hi, I'm Michelle Reed again um, with Cal Recycle. Um, something I really didn't hear at all between the two days of this conference or symposium um, is has really has to do with the you know effort. Um, by I guess the Biden administration to advance biotechnology and biomanufacturing. And for myself coming from a biochemistry background, I anticipated that we would see big overlap with, you know, processing of biomaterials, uh, biomass and so on, but I really don't see that at all. So like, where are we? I don't know who can answer this question, but why isn't there, yeah, any kind of collaboration or, you know, because biomanufacturing bio does have a lot of technological hurdles to overcome, but these are really things that could be easily applied to a lot of the te technology you all are working on. So yeah, just a thought, I want to hear more. I'll, I'll respond to that, but first, does anybody else, is anybody else plugged into uh, the biotechnology? I have not received any grant money from any administration, California Healthy Soils, nothing. So yeah. I, I would say something here. I mean, it, we all thought with the change of administration and their emphasis uh, much more on en environmentalism that there'd be a lot more money for this. And that really hasn't materialized, unfortunately. And that it's been a big, big disappointment. And you know, we, we compete for grants and it's very hard. And if there were a lot more money in the system, a lot more would get done. And it's, uh, that's, that's what's made it really, everybody who can lift a pencil, you know, we, we, as scientists, we run from bandwagon to bandwagon where the money is. So everybody who can lift a pencil has put in a proposal in that area, which of course is another big problem because it's not that we don't need new ideas there, but it kind of dilutes the, the pool even further um, for those who've been doing it for, for, well, since way before it was sexy, which uh, certainly I have been doing. And um, so it's, it's been very disappointing, I, I would say, that there hasn't been more money. We've been sending it to 
other places, but not, not enough of it going into solving the crisis at hand. If I can, uh, uh, Dan, this is Tom. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, let me see. You know, when looking at the uh, at the IRA, right, at the uh, Inflation Reduction Act uh, for you know clean energy, there's definitely a hydrogen uh, part of the conversation. Then we're talking about uh, anaerobic digestion, um, Dr. Uh, Zhang. Uh, we really, you know, I mean, a big part of that story is we're getting hydrogen from water in a digester. So instead of using electrolysis where you have, you know, electricity going uh, into water to get the hydrogen, we're getting, uh, what would you say your anaerobic digester is producing there? Is it two uh, or three of the hydrogens in the CH4 molecule that's coming from the water? Do you know, or have you done analysis on that? Okay, well, thank you, Tom. So, um, well, for using a nerve digestion for hydrogen production, so, well, there are oh, <clears throat> two sources of hydrogen. So, one is from the organic matter. So, uh, a nerve digestion is a two step process. The first step actually produce hydrogen CO2, carbon dioxide. <laughs> And the second step, take a hydrogen CO2, make methane. So we can actually um, harvest the hydrogen, we call biohydrogen, basically produce the from breakdown of this uh, uh, organic carb, uh, organic matter. So certainly there's a water involved in that process as well, but the mainly hydrogen from the digestion process is from the organic matter. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, yeah. So, um, and there's a, uh, you know, when if if you're digesting wood chips with a hydrothermal uh, conversion uh, process uh, uh, subsystem before the digester, where you're turning wood chips into porridge that can then be digested, um, there's a uh, there's a you know three or three and a half of the hydrogens of the four in the CH4 molecule. Those hydrogens are coming from the water. So not from the wood necessarily. So it's an interesting, you know, part of the story is the uh, just going back to is is what the Biden administration has put out as far as the IRA and funding for infrastructure. Uh, so that's just one little, you know, tangent. But then the other uh, side of that, uh, uh, Dr. Zhang, is basically looking at the the solid digestate. I looked at your uh, slide. Um, and I know that you're sort of more focused on the um, uh, fertilizer part of the conversation, but uh, what um, amount of uh, carbon is in your digestate? What, is that a significant uh, amount of the digestate is carbon? So, um, well, <clears throat> well, because we feed the, it's the food waste. So actually over 70% of uh, solids no, actually, over eighty percent. So eighty over eighty percent of solids is digested and converting to methane and CO two into biogas. So, but then, uh, so then, so then digestate, um, and we have around the three two three percent of solids, and about half of that is carbon. So, mm -hmm. but this again, compared with the feedstock, it's a, a small amount. Oh, it's a small amount. Okay. But, yeah, more could. Uh, it does have um, um, high BOD, and uh, but uh, I think the challenge is more about the nutrients, and mm -hmm. uh, so yeah, like nitrogen, especially nitrogen, and uh, water. So water is great, and uh, however, for this uh, community-based uh, digester, and where there's not much land around, uh, farms around. Uh, Davis actually is good, so there are in, uh, some farms in, uh, around, but the, when you have a digest community-based digester and the water digestate the, uh, become liability and actually have to pay to treat, right? So, which is a cost item. And uh, so uh, for in the past year or so, and our digestate uh, is uh, taken by composting, uh, company and uh, to actually take and spread into, I mean, add it to compost as a nutrient, a water source, which is great. But the, um, our facility does pay uh, six cents per gallon <laughs> for for someone to take it. So that's again, it's a cost. And so that's why we need to um, really looking at the um, nutrient recovery or concentration we call and the water. So separate, okay. um, so we don't uh, pay a lot of um, hauling costs, right? 
So, but uh, sorry, I got into the nutrients water. Um, mm -hmm. That's why it's a big challenge. We know how to make gas. Gas is easier to use. And then yeah. uh, now we have to pay in the end that we have to pay a lot of money to treat that as tape. That's where we need the technologies so that we can fractionate basically that just take into form so that can be uh, yeah valuable right like this. really uh, looking at that like that carbon content uh the solid uh, of the solids and mm. we right. don't have a lot of solids right so really, uh, mostly liquid okay right mostly okay. <laughs> thank you thank you Danny. yeah i'd well, like I to do get think back this to is... that go ahead sorry you want to get back to the question yeah that's okay go ahead well, I was going to say, I appreciate Michelle's question, because I think a lot of what we see, or at least, you know, kind of what we're starting with our project is about taking bio resources and breaking them down into simpler and simpler molecules. And I suppose there's a role for biotechnology to help us build systems that can do that more efficiently. I think there's uh, maybe a frontier where the molecules get broken down into um, bigger, small molecules. So not just methane you know, just what we're talking about in biogas or not just carbon monoxide or hydrogen, which is what we're talking about uh, with pyrolysis. So I, I think there's there's a real question about how we build better feedstocks because we're talking about pretty rudimentary stuff that we're getting out of some of what we're calling pathways and just trying to round the corner and say, hey, if we think about this the right way, we can produce valuable things as opposed to just try to decrease the cost of waste. And you know, I've, I've looked at it, this is not biotechnology, but I've, I've wondered about some of the things we're doing with biochar and where biochar becomes um, uh, black carbon that's useful in other sectors as well. Um, I've worked with a company that makes um, uh, energy storage systems out of uh, carbon-based uh, superconductors. And so, uh, while the fact that that one thing is existing doesn't mean that there's a huge opportunity, it just it's interesting to think about where we're producing feedstocks for high tech options. Where are we producing feedstocks that can work in biomanufacturing in some way? And and, and thank you, then Michelle. You know where um, biotechnology can be applied to help us figure out how to process this more efficiently or into different size molecules. Exactly. I, I wanted to just add a, a, a note, two notions to um, this question of biological investment that you brought up. Um, you know, I made a career decision when I was in graduate school that I was in molecular biology and I could see that all of that technology was pretty much going into medicine. There wasn't, there wasn't a future in environmentalism when I was a molecular biologist, you know, graduate student. And that was in the 70s. And if you compare the food industry to the medical industry, which I, I've thrown around some numbers through this symposium because they're always on my mind, the GDP of our whole food system is about 2%, 2 to 3% of GDP, not counting all the food brands because a lot of our food is prepared by corporations and put in the center aisles, as well as all the restaurant system and especially fast food. That part represents a retail part of our economy, not necessarily the food system. But all of ag is about 2% GDP. Medicine has been growing just in the last couple decades, and it's now up to about 17% GDP. So that's where a lot of the money is through NIH and through uh, all of uh, that grant money, but then also the investment by big pharma. And, and so, you know, we have this initiative here in California called 30 by 30 for natural and working lands, which is, I think it's 30% greenhouse gas um, sequestration in natural and working lands as part of our carbon sequestration marketplace by 2030. So there is that focus and that's kind of through executive orders right now through uh, Governor Newsom's office, but we haven't really created bioresources as a utility beyond our solid waste utilities and our um, wastewater utilities. Right now, my water bill is 60% uh, goes to wastewater treatment. 
which is where all those tipping fees, you know, it's those are the user fees, whereas fresh water is, you know, 40%. But this is in Sonoma County. The economics is a little bit different in Southern California with all the imported water. But we're sharing that investment. So there's this huge utility investment. The piece that I was thinking about in terms of risk mitigation because of the fires and and uh, and global warming, the impacts of global warming, that a lot of that has to do with the insurance companies because all of our insurance fees are going up thanks to global warming, whether it's your you know fire, but not so much earthquake, um, but then the people on the coastal. So maybe maybe there's a lot of money there for risk mitigation. And I don't think we've really tapped into it. At least I haven't talked to any insurance companies or reinsurance companies about that. But that's a huge part of our economy too. I don't know what the percent GDP is, but it's, I think it's on the order of five or 10% just to insurance companies. You know, when we're paying, think about your insurance bill versus your utility bill versus your, your phone bill and your internet bill. I pay right now, where I live, I think I pay five times just in my communication bills, which is Verizon and Xfinity for me, than I do for my water bill, which is, so if we look at, yeah. Yeah. That's <laughs> that Sacramento, I got smudged. Yeah. Yeah, so, um, so anyway, that's, it's looking at the economics of this integrated economics is something that we got to continue doing, especially for people who want, companies who want to invest in this industry. And I've been following investment in both water and bioresources for the last 40 years. And it's really a mixed bag and there's not a lot of huge returns like there are say in AI or in you know, the information industry and all the rest of that. So we've got our challenges, but I'm, I actually still feel very hopeful. People are heading out and maybe we should wrap it up unless there's more questions or comments or thoughts or further discussion. Just one more thought. There's a, I don't know if anybody's heard of kiss the ground. It's a carbon. Oh yeah, sure. Sequestering thing. That's kind of cool that uh, celebrities are into and everything else. So uh, it might yeah. be one resource that all of us have together that we can all kind of look in on and maybe yeah, we actually start. help raise about fifty thousand dollars so that they could produce the compost story cool. which ended up being a six minute video <laughs> for 50k and that and they didn't pay the actors very, very much at all they donated their time and they give them a little honorarium but nice. yeah so but I, I agree with you and kiss the ground has moved on to really promoting regenerative farming too yeah. Yeah, so um, so those big foundations like the King's family who is behind that one, and uh, there's many others. I think that's something for us to continue looking at, nonprofit, for-profit, um, municipal investments, yeah, and maybe insurance companies. I just keep thinking about it. There's a lot of money over there that's for risk mitigation. And as my fire, as our fire premiums go up, especially in woody areas, you know, that's something for us to, to seriously consider. Anyway, thank you so much for all of your time and especially a huge thanks to our, um, the support people who are doing this all gratis, of course, because we didn't raise a bunch of money for this symposium. <laughs> Everybody's doing this on, on their own uh, volunteer time. So, um, Thank you, and thank you for all of you for attending and for speaking, and we hope you remain part of this conversation moving forward. Yeah. And we used to send out um, evaluation forms, but we didn't get much response. But if you do have you know, ideas about things that ought to be covered uh, that, you know, in the future or want to um, get a discussion going with uh, you know, the, some of the speakers and other people that are interested in particular subjects, uh, you know, then we can work through that. And um, yeah, yeah, you've got all our emails on the on the bios, so you can send it to Lauren or myself or any of the others of us that are on there.
you know, and again, all the uh, speakers and moderators' bios are um, going to be on EPA's website as well as the presentations. We hope to get them up in the next couple of days. Yeah, and thank you, EPA, for this nice room. This is the first time we've ha had it here, and we would like to have it here more too. Thank you, everyone. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dan.